Um, I think we all we, we all have our shared goal here to highlight the human rights violations at our time together. Thank you, Charlene. Um, Mr. Andrew Karamaji, please. Hello, everyone. It's the early evening here in Southern Africa. Uh, it's just a few minutes after seven o'clock. Um, I am particularly thrilled to take part in this conversation because, as Charlene has indicated, um, our country has um, de deteriorated and descended into a terrible abyss. Part of my contribution will be that. This situation has not uh, fallen from the sky. Our country was conceived in violence and has been run uh, post-independence in violence and to this date remains an extractive, violent entity that does not serve the interests of citizens and that we should, beyond aspiring to have a change of guard, think about the kinds of reforms economic and political that have to be undertaken to ensure that we uh, redeem ourselves from this violent disposition of the Ugandan state. And when I talk about violence, it's not just the use of force as we know it, in military and paramilitary groups, but also structural violence, economic violence, and other forms of violence that have been associated with our otherwise beautiful country. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to learning and hearing from you, my colleagues. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I would like to introduce some from somewhere in Kampala, Halima Atmani. Thank you for joining uh, us. A, couple, a few minutes past 8 p.m., and uh, the one thing that I should have said, yes, I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much, Halima, for making the time. And uh, given the current state of uh, in internet issues, thank you for making sure that it works. Uh, I would like if, to... I may, if I may console Halima, uh, by the time we're done here, the issue that the, the that General Seven said he would talk about, um, he'll just he'll just have started dealing with it because he's going to start with the history of mankind, migration, uh, oh. human evolution, <laughs> and then. We will be in time to hear what he has to say about the fight. Exactly. Yeah. It should be 9 p.m. for him to say yeah. a paragraph or two about the ongoing situation and then, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Halima. Um, Ms. From somewhere in D.C., Mr. Lyons, being uh, the manner, I don't know if, they, um, I don't want to kill your name, so please. Uh, you did a good job with smile. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lyons Bimana. I'm the executive director of Task International. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, working with torture survivors. It's the last two years that Uganda has been making us busy because the practice of torture has uh, hiked, and especially before the elections, during the elections, and after the elections, we receive many reports of torture in Uganda. So that's why uh, I'm here in this panel that I would love to speak about that in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leons. Uh, speaking about torture, the Uganda has just had an election uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I know that I'll start with Halima. You reported um, the election and you took part in um, something that was produced by, by Ms. Dana Bullard and uh, Bass, narrated by Bass. What was your experience? <laughs> um, yeah, I, li I listened to the whole, uh, almost the whole. <laughs> What was your Thank you. uh, um, as you did report on the election and and the current status as it is now? Well, I, I think for once we saw things play out differently. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of times that I was out in the field, especially during the campaign period. I think that was the time we started um, and, and also just the campaign period, I think, was really militarized in, in many ways. Um, I, I, I remember this was one time when I was out, I, I started when Bobby Wine was in my UK. 
Um, and, and that was just one day because I was out in the field on Monday and then Tuesday was when, you know, the, 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 that was the 18th and the 19th protest started off. Um, and, and, and I think I had just left Kampala thinking, oh, after all, oops, sorry guys, um, the power, power blackout keeps going on and off. So right now, I mean, total darkness. Oh, it's back on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, so, you know, I, and, and then, you know, I, I was actually out uh, doing another story completely different from, you know, the ongoing. And then before you know it, we hear about the protests uh, where we saw a number of people being killed. Uh, we saw random shootings by, you know, civilian uh, people dressed in civilian. Obviously, most of these were military. Uh, uh, and of course, we also had to see the military themselves also of shooting um, civilian. So it, it was it was quite a hectic period, especially those two days. And I think that was when things, you know, just went southward. Um, so we, we started seeing people being arrested, uh, where security was claiming they also had guns, you know. I think you'll have to deal with my voice for now. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what's going on with the power right now. <laughs> but no, welcome, this is, the, this is the beauty of us living in Uganda. So I just hope that uh, my laptop doesn't go off, but yeah, I we'll think I'm still... We remember that very well. <laughs> yeah. So it's on and off. So, so you see, um, so after the campaigns, I mean, during that campaign period, so, so it was tough. Uh, then this particular period, we were in Barara. So the schedule indicated Bobby Wanda was supposed to be in Barara City and Barara, wherever that bit of town was. So I wake up in the morning, he goes to church. And, you know, even around church, there was heavy military deployment. I kept wondering, what, what's the use? The man has just come to pray, you know. So we leave that and then, you know, they, they, and, and then you even Museveni didn't probably have his convoy, I think during the also uh, security personnel, I think at a certain point, so almost 12, uh, 12 or 14 pickups of, you know, of soldiers and police mixed up and he kept wondering, what is the need? What is the use of all of this? But I think this was the point when I think it was the one marking who is who, you know, the one profiling who are most you know, the people who are mostly by his side during this period. And I think after that, um, that is when we eventually see the Kal Nation and it takes us to Kalangala, you know, where almost everyone was, was taken up. And then now all of a sudden we hear stories of who are found with guns. I mean, I keep asking myself, um, how do you start saying uh, someone like Nubian Lee? Not that, uh, about what's going on and, and right now, just uh, two, three weeks back, I've been also trying to do a story about who have just been abducted, you know? Uh, unfortunately, there's a family that I, I spoke to two women who were just crying, you know, they're, they're, they're one of them. Um, and, and I'd like to also to use this opportunity just to mention this guy's name is called Martin Lukwago. Uh, so on, on the 23rd of November, I think security personnel went to Bugolobi market one person was shot. Uh, they picked up about 11 young men, drove them around, kept beating them. And, and then in the middle, I, I don't know, somewhere I think around Wienga. So they let go of 10 young men and then they remain with this one guy uh, who is Martin Lukwago. And until today, he's not been seen anywhere. The young man who was shot, he's gone to the village. No one knows what's going on with him, if he's gotten treatment or he's not. So, you know, even tonight as we wait for the president's speech, we're just hoping and waiting to see what's going to happen. But interestingly, uh, this afternoon, I received a call from a colleague who says, do you know that majority of people who were picked up, because a number of people were picked up also around the Mukono area. Uh, and, and I think many of those came up and, and, and if you try to speak to them, they say, no, we really can't talk, about, talk to you right now. So I think we'll have to wait. But then there are those who were picked up and then they were dropped, I think, last night. About 11 people were released last night. So my, my question is, where were they? I have tried, I've gotten in touch with prisons. Many of the names I had on my list when no one knew where they were. I had other than another colleague who is also doing a story for The Economist. He's also been trying and looking for, you know, people who've been abducted, people who've been tortured. All we have are names, but names with no faces, names with no idea of their whereabouts. So that is the kind of situation that, you know, we have in the country currently. In Thank you very much. Um, again, I, I, I always listen to Voice of America and um, I, I, your voice is still uh, live to me. <laughs> and thank you thank for the you. very detailed uh, description of, of what uh, you went through and what uh, you saw as a journalist as well. And I know being on this panel probably puts in a lot of danger because we know the, the, the junta has, is, um, is not doing 
justice to the journalists. I want to bring in Leons now as a, as a person who has an organization that deals with torture. What, what's your take on the current state of affairs in Uganda vis-a-vis -vis the torture and as a person who is uh, who helps? Uh, right before the elections, we, we did set up a, two weeks. We received 316 reports of torture and abduction from citizens. And we followed up with those people to ask them what's going on. And of course, that was a time where the internet was shut down. So we kind of missed some like one or two days, but we find other ways to, to speak to them. Hundred citizens that we know very well with names and locations and, and contacts. And that was very, very concerning. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, um, realized how many uh, type of torture are being used. The government has been really creative in you know, uh, different, different type of torture. Um, but what I can see as a difference between other as a situation we have, we have observed in Uganda is that during uh, the elections and a little bit before the elections, we observed a torture of simple citizens because before we were used to um, torture of opposition politicians, uh, journalists and other high level uh, people like uh, uh, you know, authors and other things, but we have observed torture of simple citizens uh, during these elections and before and after the elections. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing that we have observed uh, a lot is the enforced disappearance. The enforced disappearance uh, is a, a phenomenon that occurs when a person is secretly abducted or imprisoned by states or a political organization. And we have observed a lot of that. You all heard about the, the drone cars. Um, that, that's something we've never learned before, but we, or we've seen that. But also, automatically practiced, we share the psychology, not knowing whether and you could see many people, many uh, normal citizens in Uganda uh, uh, afraid uh, involved happening to them. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop by here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leons. Uh, I'd like to bring in Andrew. Andrew, as a person who was, uh, Leons was talking about forced disappearance. And uh, I would like to say now that Halima has put on uh, is it a candle. <laughs> That's very, very interesting. She has lit a candle to stay on the, you're staying on ahead of the game. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the only option that I have right now. <laughs> that, that, that's Uganda for you. Um, you are my hero. <laughs> Andrew, as a person who just left uh, Uganda and you're somewhere in South Africa, what, uh, what is, what, how does it feel like to be away from home, to be um, a destitute somewhere? Take us through about um, uh, your journey and how you ended up in South Africa, where you can, please. Well, Smile, I have actually been working outside of Uganda for a while now. Um, it wasn't at, the, at this election that I left. Um, but yes, I can still um, uh, take on the question and respond. Um, I will tell you that just leading off of the uh, Leonce's statement, what we now have is a change of words uh, to drone, but there were actually, and Halima can confirm if she recalls, blue, this time they are gray, metallic gray vans, but a few years ago, these were navy blue vans. I remember one in which I was uh, taken, UP1931, I can't forget the number plate because um, I, I was put in there, beaten until my ankles got numb, my ankles and knees and elbows, they, they always go for those particular joints um, and other things that I can't say here. Um, so either, I think scholars will have to help us appreciate whether this exposure is because of more media attention or because there's just been a, um, an exponential increase in the use of torture. Now, about my own situation, um, I had actually planned to come home, and a number of us uh, Ugandans in this in, in the country and, and in the region had gotten leave and were excited about going home. 
until uh, we received information, some of us, that we are lead sponsors of, the, of subversion, not even of the opposition, of subversion, and were advised to stay away. I actually came as, clo as close as Kenya. I wanted to come in by road, and the people insisted and said, um, you are one of the people that is being looked for. And so rather than donate myself and be harvested, quote unquote, like a grasshopper, I figured it would be more useful for me to make noise from outside than go and hand myself over. And indeed, the next day, when I just had such discussions, Nicolas Opio, my colleague, uh, was arrested violently, detained alongside a couple of our colleagues uh, who are also lawyers. My experience has been, I mean, it's, it's alienating. It's, it's not that I'm, I'm here because, you know, I, I would want to be home. Uh, I would love to be home and uh, check on my nephews, my nieces, uh, and my other family members. But that's not possible. But I also understand that this is part of the um, modest price because others have paid with their lives, others have paid with their limbs. So this is a modest price that we should be ready to pay uh, in the push for a more enlightened form of, govern of, of governance for our country. I can tell you that the diaspora here is strong across the region and beyond. I mean, an activity like this one, um, my friends are all tuned in and following this, this, this discussion. So what I take from it is really, let's not uh, relent, let's not feel discouraged. Uh, this is something that we can, it will come down ultimately to willpower, to who has greater willpower, not so much who has more firepower. That's what I believe and that's what is driving me and pushing me forward. Thank you very much, Andrew, and for sharing um, your experience. And, and, and sorry about being in that situation. And I know some of us on this panel as well could uh, feel the shoes that you're in. I'd like to bring in, speaking about uh, good governance, Charlene Navulime has, uh, is a former Waltham city councillor. Waltham is one of the great cities in Massachusetts, and Waltham is also dubbed the Kampala of Massachusetts. Uh, Charlene, as, as somebody who has worked in a, in, a, um, in a government that works, what do you think Ugandans should do to be able to, to attain um, the dream that the cape that you're putting on, the change that that, that red um, beret is always promising Ugandans. What can we do as Ugandans in the diaspora, as, as Africans, what can we do to get democracies to our countries? And for it to work just like you worked in one that really, really works. So um, first and foremost, um, as you all know, I'm a refugee from Uganda and I'm so glad that Massachusetts welcomed me. And um, um, when I was younger, I used to say something that I don't believe anymore because I used to say that you cannot legislate from Washington and heal what ails Africa. Africans have to rise up and heal what ails Africa. But, and we have, um, look at Bobby Wine and um, the people's movement and the young people involved in that movement. However, in Washington, you can stop aiding and abetting a dictator and an, and an authoritarian. So right now, uh, what, what can we do in the diaspora? There are 22 senators on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I'm blessed to have one of my state senators, Ed, Ed Markey, on that committee. So I urge you to find out, you know, to um, uh, poor people. All that money has gone to militarize and, and, and just further strengthen his chokehold on our democracy. So when, I, when you told me about speaking of being a city councillor as it relates to Uganda, I, I, I was up all night, puffy eyes, um, as evidence, trying to find uh, um, correlations and really there aren't. It's like never the twain shall meet because I was elected in a functional democracy and um, except I, have, I do have to tell this story that I tell all the time. When I was running for city council, I'm knocking on doors, you know, 
this Ugandan with all this uh, energy about how to make change in Waltham and I had all these ideas. So I tell this man that, oh, we, we, we need a, a planning board. And he says, he said to me, it's not the job of a city council to plan the city. We already have a city planner and it's certainly not the job of a city councillor from Uganda. <laughs> you know, when we look at Uganda and our youth and uh, what they have done is highlight the fact that th they can't stand for um, Museveni's oppressive ways anymore, his tyrannical rule, his barbaric um, uh, uh, rule, and they're going to, and they're going to America. The youth are done with our two party, um, party political system. That's why they're so involved in the, in, in the, um, in the progressive movement. They, are, they, they, they haven't seen government work as it should with Democrats. They haven't seen government as it sh work as it should with uh, Republicans. And they're thinking, hmm, what's wrong with this picture? How can we effect change? So I'm so proud of, of, of that generation, which includes my daughter. Those young adults are, are really, um, they, they, they are teaching us so much about affecting change. So your question was, what can we do? Write to our senators, tweet, make our voices hard, protest, because if America and the West continue to enable these people, as long as it's expe politically expedient for them, yes, Uganda was, uh, did, did, you know, an, a great job combating HIV, for example, but just one good deed of a dictator a tyrant cannot um, compensate or cannot um, uh, make up for all the bloodshed and the lives he's taken. My brother was exiled to Sweden when Museveni took, um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, seized our government when, during that war. And what some of these young people don't realize is that Museveni would go into a village at night, kill off all the parents, come back in the morning and say, oh my gosh, what happened here? Oh, you know, then they would, they would lament. Say, you know, you, do you want retribution? Join my army. Because people wonder how can he have uh, this army of loyalists because they think he rescued them. That is, that is um, the smarter version of Idi Amin, okay? So um, when you look at somebody like Museveni and, 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 and what his, what, what his, what he's done to our country, you have to say, okay, what can we do in Washington? We have to cut off aid. That's, that's, that's my, my next big thing. Um, uh, organize, um, uh, use all my, uh, my, my campaign skills and everything I learned uh, uh, running for office to make my, our voices heard in Washington. So uh, th um, that's, that's my take on it. Thank you very much. And and speaking about aid, I know that the United States uh, gives Uganda annually nine hundred and fifty million dollars, and that is um, it's documented. And that's my taxes. That is your taxes as the person who pays. And I, I, li I like to bring um, Halima, who is on a candle, to to jump, <laughs> to jump in here. What 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 is it that Museveni does? Maybe anybody after Halima. What is it that Museveni does, and even with all the torture that is going on, I know that um, the EU um, Parliament uh, a few hours ago put some resolutions in. We know that uh, Senator Menendez in Washington has a bill that uh, that is uh, about to be tabled. What is it that he does that makes that hoodwinks the West to think that everything is right in Uganda? Alima, I think it's not really what he does to hood. Uh, let's not forget not to sound so much uh, like a Seveni supporter here, but um, <laughs> we all know that the war in South Sudan, the war in Somalia, these I think are the two uh, platforms where President Seveni has shown uh, the Western world that he still has power and he has the might, he's able to control affairs in these two countries. Um, if, if the U.S. went into Somalia and they were defeated, the UPDF went in there and, you know, and, 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 and made, ensured that, you know, things are back in order. So I think those are the things. Let's look at, at South Sudan when, when things broke out in 2013, I think. 
um, I don't know if it, I think it was 2013, yeah, I don't know, thereabout, uh, when, when, the, when the war broke out, um, it was again, it was the UPDF that went in to ensure that things stay in order, uh, see things, uh, you know, stabilize a bit, but also don't forget that even when they went there, whether they were stabilizing or maybe they were also, you know, adding on to the conflict, Remember when 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 Sudan when 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 the refugees are running from all these countries again Uganda currently uh, is home to over 1.4 million refugees so and no other country is opening their doors for, for people who are coming who are running away from conflict in their countries so so you find that these efforts these things that the president is doing is what you know the West will always look and say but wait yeah. on the other hand he's also you know keeping the foot uh, for us when it comes to Somalia to South Sudan refugees coming in. Otherwise, uh, many people worry, where would these refugees go? I think two years back, you, you had Kenya say they're going to have uh, their largest refugee camp, which is, I think, Dadaab. And they're saying that we're going to, you know, uh, ask all the, the, the refugees to go back to their home countries. And again, again, Uganda still seemed like the destination for many of these people. So, so as much as, yes, Currently, we see the EU not happy about how the elections are run. Um, the United States also the same, that they were all not happy about how the elections are run. As we remember, the, they were not even allowed to, you know, um, uh, I mean, uh, accreditation, but only 15% of, of, the, of, their, of their crews were, were, were let in. And, and, you know, both, uh, I think, countries say, uh, sorry, the EU block, and then the United States said, we can't, we can't just observe the whole of Uganda with just 15%. And I think when I was out in the field, the only one that I saw, I think, was the United Nations. They were the ones who were trying to traverse. But I think even for them, it was really limited. They could only traverse within Kampala, not beyond you know, so so I think those are the things that President Seven is able to, you know, show the, the Western world that if you think that I am useless now, remember I am in charge. Just recently, you heard about the uh, eventually. Uh, I don't know what happened. I, I think there was a story about how the UPDF had killed 187 Al Shabab. Uh, Al, Al Shabab members, and everyone, I don't know, everyone. I think the story uh, was in Reuters. And then before, so, so I started calling. A colleague said, Halima, can you just double check and see if this is true? So I'm calling, I'm calling the UPDF spokesperson, uh, sorry, the, he's her deputy, and, she, and he says, no, you have to call Amnesom in Somalia. They should be the one to give you information. I, I reach out to a contact who works for Amnesom and said, no, I, we did not generate that uh, information. I think it was the UPDF itself. So eventually you come to realize that the story is fake. And then, uh, you know, the story was taken down by Reuters. Uh, so, so you see that, them even going to an extra mile just you know to create this fake story about the, the killing of al-shabaab i think in a way it was just to remind the western world hey this is what we can do and this is if, if you want to think that we are not good to stay in power then this is what this is how messy the, the region will be without president seven year at the helm of uh, of leadership Thank you very much. And I know you, yourself, and uh, a couple of other journalists that are based in the Horn of Africa, they really, really, really uh, put, bashed that story. They, they made the UPDF look like kids. And I know as, as part of being to, I think the elections were really, really planned in such a way that they happened on the 14th and then the, the, uh, the MTV Best Awards were supposed to do the cleanup of the image. They knew what they were doing. They knew that they were going to arrest people, torture them, and then have an award to show the West, look, we had an election, people okay, died, I but I mean, yeah. but things are normal. So I, I saw a hand from Andrew, and then I'll go to Shalene. Andrew, what's your response to Halima's uh, submission? I couldn't agree more with, with, with Halima. Um, and I'd only add the UPDF as mercenaries beyond our military being used uh, to so to fight wars that we have no geostrategic or geopolitical reasons for engaging in. It is also the use of our military as mercenaries. Besides Somalia and South Sudan, you know that we have deployments as far as Equatorial Guinea, Chad, and we've also previously deployed in Burundi. And the other point, and for viewers who are interested in following this up, Helen Epstein, uh, an American researcher, has done an excellent job in a book titled Another Fine Mess, where she lays bare this relationship and shows how much it's been damaging to Uganda and uh, the citizens, our economy, and so on. The 
the, the additional point I'd like to make responding to your question, Ismail, uh, regarding what uh, General Museveni does to keep the West um, in his, you know, in his pocket is the implementation of ruthless economic reforms of a neoliberal nature, which uh, feature about three things. The liberalization of the economy, one, so that there is no regulation or restraints on multinational capital, be it financial services, mining, and other extractives, deregulation of the same economy, um, and of course, liberalization, which I've already mentioned. These neoliberal reforms pave the way for major, major league corporate interests, and these in turn provide the regime with funding that enables it to uh, maintain a hold, a stranglehold on power. So it's important in addition to the military angle of it to also consider the ruthless economic reforms that um, the anti-people, I should say that, anti-people economic reforms that Museveni has continuously and over the years implemented that have made Uganda a, a football field or a playground for any and everybody, from those grabbing land, from those polluting our lakes and rivers, from those mistreating laborers, to those using Uganda as a hub for sex trafficking, human trafficking, organ trafficking, and all manner of illicit trade. It's important to appreciate how the connection between the military angle, the economic angle, and all these things that we see happening around us as being one of the other pillars of the regime. I, I wanted to make that uh, point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Shalin, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, th that was awesome. I have to piggyback on what um, uh, Halima said about, you know, the wars in uh, the war in Sudan and Museveni showing his um, um, a military prowess. The <sighs> so. I have so much to say, and I, I, I don't want to lose my uh, uh, track of thought, but um, the US and other countries bowing out of that, uh, um, of, of, of um, uh, overseeing the election, to me was such a cowardly act because even 15% observance would have been better than nothing. But no observance meant no accountability, meaning we can continue to um, benefit from our uh, diplomatic relationship with Uganda while Ugandans are being killed. And, you know, we, we weren't there, so we really don't know what happened. And so for me, um, as, as a Ugandan American, I actually tweeted the, um, uh, you know, I, I don't mince words on Twitter. <laughs> I, I, I called them up for, for their cowardice and um, going forward, I, I, I always ask uh, UN, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the US mission in Uganda, um, uh, the, um, uh, the International Criminal Court, that where are the sanctions against Museveni for all the human rights violations? As, as the Secretary of State recently said that they're watching the situation closely. And I tweeted them saying, if you watch any closer, you might get blind because this situation has been going on for over 35 years. And when does it end? So we have to, again, keep uh, do it, keep talking about this, keep putting the pressure on, and that's how uh, we affect change. And um, uh, uh, give them give them no rest because um, I'm sitting here in, you know, in Waltham, Massachusetts, yes, my alarm is on, but I'm not so worried if I don't put my alarm on uh, because I, 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 I feel safe. But it's also, uh, to me, it's a false sense of security, uh, remembering what I escaped and what my uh, country women and men are going through. So I, I again, I, I'll, I'll keep, it's, I'll keep, you know, killing the horse over and over again. We have to write our senators, we have to, um, tell the U.S. government, the International Criminal uh, Court, um, the U.S. mission in Uganda, that you are complicit. The longer you stay silent um, uh, is very telling of your complicity and, and the fact that really you don't care. Because if you cared, you would, again, impose, impose sac sanctions and um, cut di di diplomatic ties with Uganda. It's, it, 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 
there is no oh let's let's wait and see what happens we are, we are watching it closely the time is now thank you and very, very quickly if you let me just 30 seconds just to buttress Shalin's fantastic point besides viewing this as an a humanitarian issue for Ugandans the Americans and other allies of the of General Museveni's regime should know that their complicity also in the long run affects their own economic interests and interests back home. Chaos in Uganda will portend uh, uh, this instability at some level in their own countries. So they'd better deal with it where it is before it spreads uh, or it reaches them where they are. There's Thanks. multiple lessons in history to prove that very point. Um, uh, um, uh, Martin Luther King said it best, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to bring in Leons. We have a new administration in DC and as a uh, an organization based in DC, they, I wonder if the current state of Uganda could be on, with everything that's going on, I know Trump is being impeached as I speak right now. Uh, we know some of the um, some people, some legislators, or some technical people haven't yet been confirmed, for example. But still, the social media is awash with a lot of images of torture of, 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 of people that are going through this. So, what as as a DC guru, uh, if if you allow me to call you that, what 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 would it take to have Uganda on on um, on top of discussions down there? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to mention, you know, from your question that um, on the first day of Biden administration, he mentioned uh, together with his, uh, um, you know, also uh, administration mentioned that they're going to really uh, go back on international scene, uh, including holding accountable human rights abusers uh, around the world. And um, from that, I want to mention that we all reports that we got from the citizens, the military was mentioned as the main uh, torturer, including ISO, International Security Organization, Special Forces Command, SFC, and CMI. And for example, there is a there is a mechanism here in the US called National Defense Authorization Act. Actually, if you know that military around the world is involved in human rights abuses you can request the United States to stop funding that military, for example, through what they call the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act. And that is an activity where citizens actually has, uh, the citizens can request that, that the US stop funding military if you have evidence that that military uh, uh, is involved in human rights abuses. And from what I understood this like, uh, um, uh, vans where people are abducted, are abducted. Those are military vans, and many there, there are many um, reports of uh, illegal uh, detention centers. Uh, most of them held by SFC and, and, and CMI. All of that information could actually get, uh, if we people put it together with evidence, that could get the U.S. Uh, stop the military funding. Maybe because that money is probably going to help. The military in Uganda to continue to oppress uh, citizens. That's one thing. And uh, you also mentioned, Ismail, that there is a bill going on with the Congressman um, uh, Menendez. I think Uganda should rally behind that, that bill because there's really good language and good, um, good action uh, points that could help in you know, holding Uganda accountable. Uh, that's the second thing. So most of these things could be done really by citizens because uh, Biden or his administration or Congress people, they 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 have like a hundred, a um, hundred fifty something countries to 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 you know to look at. So it's up to Ugandan citizens in U.S. to actually bring those issues at the table. And because you're citizens, you you pay taxes, they're going to listen to you. And there's a clear mechanism on how to do that. And if anyone wants to be involved, please reach out to us. We we can help in that. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, from what has been happening in Uganda, now we are seeing many uh, asylum seekers from Uganda in US and many of them are in detention. So we, 
unfortunately they leave Uganda seeking for safety here, but then they found themselves in detention again here. So I think Uganda engineers should rally around that subject um, to, to help their fellow Ugandans who are detained uh, in, 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 uh, in here in US to be uh, released. Because most of the time, some of these people are detained because they don't have a, a connection with the community. So that's something also Uganda could rally around. I think there's someone here on uh, called Sylvia from the C Cameroon American Council. She's done a lot of work with Cameroonians. Maybe you can get some advice with on her how to how to to get that done. So that thank you. Thank you, Leons. That that was very uh, informative, and I'll be I'll be reaching out to you. Uh, um, uh, because I, I I need guidance. You've been doing the work of um, uh, you've been doing this important work, and we need guidance uh, moving forward and making our voice not just heard but effectively heard. So thank you. Yeah, there, there's a question for you, um, Shalin, in the chat from Andrea Baron. Um, Catherine Clark is a liberal American congresswoman who represents Waltham. Has anyone tried to meet with her? or her staff, and a previous uh, participant also wanted to know what your Twitter handle is. Oh, my Twitter handle is um, uh, capital letter S, H-A-R-L-I-N-E, my first name Charlene, and capital letter N. Actually, I'll type, my, I'll type it in, in the chat so that um, we can um, get that, all right? So um, uh, Catherine Clark is uh, just an amazing woman. When I when I when I when I won um, uh, uh, my election, she was one of the first people who reached out to me to congratulate me because not only was I the first um, Ugandan American to hold public office in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I was the first African American on the Waltham City Council, first um, uh, refugee, obviously, and first woman in my ward. And um, as you'll see on Twitter, I make a lot of noise. And um, I <laughs> uh, uh, keyword former because I asked too many questions. You know, they wanted to have a seat on the table. But when you shake the table uh, too much, um, they uh, they come out with guns blazing. <laughs> That's a story for another time. But um, I, yes, it would be nice to meet with Catherine Clark. But uh, my, for me, I I. I um, I, because of the dire situation in Uganda, I, I feel like even those meetings can't be wasted. Not that it would be wasted on Catherine Clark, but we need to um, uh, really get to Senator Markey because he's on the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. And um, um, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll be asking Leons and his friend, you know, how we can how we can utilize our representative, but most importantly, the senator on that committee, because they, 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 they are the legislators. They, they make decisions about a foreign policy, and um, and those decisions obviously inadvertently affect how, you know, uh, what they give Uganda and 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 how they relate to uh, these dictators and authoritarians. So I think uh, to answer your question, we'll be going to Ed Markey first and see how we can also. Um, um, include uh, Catherine Clark, but thank you for the question. Any and, other I, and I think that we should add to that brief the issue of the exploitation of the refugee crisis mm -hmm. for financial and other benefits that the regime gets by hosting refugees whom it has created. Mm -hmm. uh, that point should be this sparks the very refugee. Uh, crisis, and then General Museveni poses as the, you know, messiah, portrays himself as a messiah, mm -hmm. and the West is all too happy to provide so-called support to host mm -hmm. a, a million plus refugees. That should equally be underscored. Mm -hmm. Our host had been uh, toppled. I don't know who by, but uh, <laughs> is back. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think the internet happened just like, um, <laughs> at least it's not as worse I, as it is for Halima. As, okay. as we, have, as we uh, end the discussion, guys, I know I missed a couple of things, but I was listening. Mm -hmm. uh, the technical team did its best to, to bring me back. What do you think we could take away from um, 
the discussion. What do what what does everybody want? Somebody who is listening in Kampala, somebody who is listening in the diaspora, and in your own capacity, what what would be the takeaway? And and what what can Ugandans do? Because we know that this South Sudanese did it. We right now we are seeing how the people in uh, Myanmar are doing it out of the blue. Um, <clears throat> Somebody is arrested, and the tens of thousands of people on the street. What can Ugandans do to be able to demand for the justice? I know, like uh, Charlene said, you she will stab the horse a lot of times, but we need. Uh, they, I think the horse needs to be reminded. So, I'll, I'll choose to go with Halima. Please. <laughs> well, I, I think Ugandans have. I think we tried um, in, in, in during, to the, I think the 2001, 2006 elections, after after those elections when Dr. Kizavesidio was participating, I think to a certain extent, Ugandans tried to come out in the field, uh, to come out to the streets and they realized they probably do not have as much power as the regime itself. So I think for many people, they have just decided to resort, uh, resort to just sitting back and, and in a way, for me, I, I've just been saying that uh, these elections for many Ugandans was more of a protest vote. People did not enter. And on the streets, there was literally nothing. I think until an hour later, that's when, you know, there was, I think, an organization by the ruling party, and then they brought people out to go and start, you know, making noise on the streets. That is when something happened. But literally, believe me, if someone threw a pin on that on, on the road anywhere, you could actually hear it. That's how silent people were. For this election, I think many people came out. And, and on election day, I, so I, I just decided to, me and a colleague, drive out of to vote, knowing that the person I'm voting for is not going to be announced the winner. But I want the person who is going to win. And, it, and these were his words. I want the person who is going to win or who is going to rig the elections to know that the person he won has the support of the people. So for me, I think this vote was more of a protest vote, irrespective of who was eventually declared winner. And as a journalist with everything that is going on, I think for me, my part, uh, I'm not going to go out and protest, I won't lie, <laughs> but my, the, my role for me is, especially now that with, what, with everything that is going on with these abductions, with these killings, I think my job is going to be to just put faces to these names. I'm still going to sing about Nalumo Vicent, a young man who was picked up from Bugolobi. I'm still going to make noise about Lukwago Martin, who was picked up in November, in November until today. His family is still crying out. No one knows where they were. Recently, I, I thought I had given them hope by indicating to them to go to a prison. The family went to the prison. They called me up and said, Hanima, we are here and we're told that he's not here. Do you know where else? I just said, I'll keep trying. So I think for me right now, my role is just going to be keep putting these faces. Let people not forget these people who've been taken away for months now. Uh, can, they were just supporters. This, this is politics. They were just supporters. Maybe, of course, now we can say of the wrong party, but you know, but there's freedom of expression. There's freedom of, of association that should be maintained. But I think we just need to keep putting it out there that the people who lost their lives, people who, who left families behind. Uh, Leon said, talked about, you know, that psychological torture. These families are going through a lot of torture, just not knowing where the family is. This guy that I keep talking about, yeah. Last two seconds, last, so my last two seconds. This guy called Lukago Martin, apparently you had actually had, had two annual operations and he was supposed to go in for a third annual operation. His situation should be very there wherever he is. So I think just to keep these faces and these names into the, into the news is going to be my role. Thank you, Ismail. Thank you very much, Halim. And please keep safe. We know that the 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 the, the um, Museveni is really really hunting down people who are speaking up truth to power. So whatever you do, make sure you keep safe. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for your work. And thank, thank you. you for all you do, please. And thank you for lighting up that candle. I would like to give <laughs> thanks to Shalene. Yay. To, yay. I'd like to all give right. Shalene, uh, Shalene your last words, please. Before um, I jump into Andrew and then you, Leons. Those are my last words. People power. <laughs> Our power. All right. Thank you very much, Shalene. Uh, Andrew, please. Thank you, Shalene. That's powerful. Um, for me, it's, uh, as I said earlier, and without the country and power of the wheel, not so much the guns. And I would request 
Leon's in his own closing statements to help us appreciate or give us some thoughts as an expert in this field of, of torture and, you know, isn't it possible that the entire Ugandan population, if you've seen what was done to the fingernails of Ronald Segawa, if you've seen the gory images of, you know, I've seen Ugandans watching those videos and squirming, like you see someone. So isn't it possible that in fact, the entire population has been tortured by this, by what has happened, even though it's not happened to them physically, you know, something we should think about. But I would end by still underscoring the point about why we need to uh, do whatever we can. On my part, I'll continue writing the articles for which I was offered, and I can say it here, 200 million Uganda shillings to delete my Facebook account <laughs> and stop <laughs> writing articles. Uh, I'll, whatever it is, writing bills, letters, and if I'm in Uganda, actually taking part in protests, as I have before, we can all do something sing a song, um, you know, it's been proved how potent music and art is. So all these things, um, yay, Halima! <laughs> and whatever it is everyone can do, let's do it and get ourselves out of the rut that we find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for, for that. Uh, my producer tells me that we can take Two questions, if we can, maybe after Leon's. Leon's, your closing remarks on that. And if we have questions, we'll take them. If we don't, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you. To come back to Andrew's question, uh, so in literature, it says that most of the government, they practice torture, not necessarily to, you know, to, 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 towards that person who is being tortured, but to actually instill fear in other people. So I think that is the main objective uh, of this type of systematic torture. Uh, so everybody feels like they could actually be a candidate to torture. And so definitely that psychological torture to the whole nation or whoever is, is watching that. Uh, I also wanted to mention that, of course, it's impossible for torture victims to get uh, justice in Uganda, as many have been trying, but we haven't seen any positive uh, thing from the justice in Uganda. But there are many ways that Ugandans can get justice elsewhere. This is the ICC in the US here. We have many mechanisms like the Global, Global Magnitsky Act, where actually someone 